we're very interested in how you might think about games as an art form and what the meaning of a game is, what it means to play with someone and what meaning can be brought out of the act of playing with someone. You know, the motivation behind this is around how um, data is being manipulated in the background, uh, how your uh, profiling and personalization uh, systems are being used on you in almost every single um, digital domain. So uh, the first thing I thought I'd do is just dive straight in and uh, show a piece of our work. This is a, a game called I'd Hide You. Uh, this uh, video is from uh, 2012. Welcome to I'd Hide You. I'd Hide You is an online game. Three runners stream live video in high definition from the streets of Manchester. Online players enter their name and pick a runner from one of the three teams to ride with. Um, my strategy for playing is going to be uh, to be as stealthy as possible and going to be quiet and fast. Pick a runner to follow. Watch their video. And if you spot another runner in the shot, click to take a snap. But this is more than just a game. This is a live transmission. You see what they see. You hear what they hear. Tell your runner where to go, tweet their location, help them or distract them. This is how it starts. On to the last game of the evening. In Manchester's northern quarter. So if you can just help me out to get Nikki and Matt and we can work together. Have you seen anybody dressed like me around here? No. That no? Way. That way. Are you sending me on a wild goose No, honestly, chase? I've just seen them. I've swear down, down there. Where's the stag? Any ideas about where anyone is would be helpful. <sighs> I think he's trapped me now. How do I deal with this situation? I might just go sit on this bench for a minute, to be honest. Do you mind if I sit here? Yeah, come on. Is that OK? Yeah, what are you doing, guys? I'm playing a game. What are you doing? Yes, we've got ourselves a sexy dance. I'm gonna hide, I think, or try and hide. I need to do my shoelace up. This is a disaster. You do my shoelace up? Oh, he's double knotting it like a trooper. I'm having a bit of a hard time. Why, what's up, babe? I uh, can't seem to find anyone. They all went off down there, but I know, they ran away from me and I couldn't find them. Do you want to buy me a shot? We're in high Oh, Jesus. Um, I'm curious, sorry. Here you go. You're mine. I'm not stealing the car. This was my refuge. I'm, yeah, we're all from the future. <gasps> Oh my god, I love onion bargies. Hello? Could I get an onion bargie, please? Do you, would you like to play me? Yeah, I really want to play you. Please, send me directions as where to Abby is going to go. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. So, as you saw, it's an online game played online and on the streets. And what you've got is those three people are playing against each other, trying to film each other without getting filmed. And then online players are dropping in and, uh, and trying to ride on board with who they think is about to film someone else. So it's a really simple bit of gameplay. It's really quick and immediate and easy to share, but it draws you into a relationship with three people on a certain set of city streets on a certain night. And that game runs for about three hours. Uh, typically in that time, uh, 20 or 30,000 snaps will be taken by players. And what you see is that in that case, Manchester is the first city we did it. it uh, uh, you see the full sort of spectrum of that city across a night where you see people going out in their glad rags, stag groups with some poor idiot dressed as a geisha at the beginning of the evening. And by the time you get to the end of the evening, people are staggering out of nightclubs and stepping over the vomit and all the other joys that a British city centre will offer you on a Friday or a Saturday night. So why are we doing that and you know, what's, what lies behind a project like that? We're a group of artists. We're based in Brighton in the UK on the south coast. I work with my colleagues Juro Farr and Nick Tandavanich, and we've been collaborating together since 1991. 
We often work with the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham, so they are really key partners in terms of the technology and the uh, innovation side of some of the tech that we're doing. So, for example, we did a year-long research project into new models for outside broadcasting before we made that I'd hide you project going, why do you need a big truck to do OB? Why, you know, you've got devices that capture in HD, you've got network bandwidth that enables you to stream in HD, surely you should be able to do something better, lighter, easier. And you could see those, those little kits we're using are, um, uh, are fairly low cost, they're relatively low cost. So we, we're artists, that's our background. Um, we come from different branches of the arts, the, the, uh, Jew and Nick and I, but what we're trying to do is think about how you make art in an interactive age. How can you make art that is as rich and deep and immersive and complex and sophisticated as possible? And to do that, we try and do work across a range of different strategies. So I'd Hide You is really at one end where it's a game, it's super playful, really warm and inviting, very quick to access. Some of the other projects I'm gonna show you, you'll see that it's kind of looking at it in a slightly different way. We're very interested in how you might think about games as an art form and what the meaning of a game is, what it means to play with someone and what meaning can be brought out of the act of playing with someone. And we're very interested in thinking about new spaces for art. We want to put our work where people already are. We don't want to ex expect people to come to a gallery or a museum. We want people to stumble on it. You know, our, our absolute goal is a 15 or a 16 year old kid who is interested in the world, who may never have been to theater or dance or ballet or visual art, may never have had access to any of that sort of stuff. We want that person to be able to bump into our work and have an amazing experience and for that to open a new door in their life because that's such a key moment where we all find our cultural identity. That's a kind of touchstone for us. That's not to say that that's you know, all that we're about, but it's, it's a question that we always ask ourselves with any project, could someone you know, what would that person feel like if they stumbled, you know, onto this URL and were dropped into this situation? And as you saw in that I'd Hide You project, live presence and performativity is really important. I come from a background in theater, so I'm really excited and interested in that thrill of liveness that you, that you get. Uh, and yeah, that photo is, you know, one of our games being played in Germany and a whole bunch of kids joining in and running with Dickie as he, as he, as he plays that game. Uh, so, uh, the, the next project I'm, I'm going to show is um, Ulrika and Eamon Compliant. Uh, it's a contrast to I'd Hide You in some ways. Uh, it was a commission for the Venice Biennale. Uh, and uh, what we decided to do was to invite people to take a walk through the streets of Venice, uh, taking on the role of either Ulrika Meinhof or Eamon Collins. And you don't necessarily know quite what's going to happen when you begin that walk but it ends up with an interview in a hidden church. And I'm gonna show you a bit of video in a second so you can see that. Uh, as many of you are probably aware, Ulrike Meinhof was a, a key member of the Red Army faction, a terrorist group in West Germany in the late 1960s and early 1970s. She's a fascinating person in many ways. Uh, she was extremely well known and prominent in Germany. She p appeared on TV, uh, on, on panel shows and so on before she made the jump to, to, to joining uh, Andreas Bader and Gudrun Enslin to, to form this, this group. And she wrote with tremendous clarity and intelligence about her journey all the way through from not being in any way interested in violence through to being a, a committed revolutionary. Uh, she was um, captured in 1972 and hung herself in prison. And Eamon Collins is much less well known, but he wrote an amazing book called Killing Rage. And he joined the IRA in the late 1970s. Uh, the Irish Republican Army um, committed to uh, a, a, an, isle, an island, a Northern Ireland free of British rule. And uh, a, a, again, he wrote extensively about this process with tremendous clarity and intelligence. Um, uh, uh, he, he rose through the ranks in the IRA and joined what was called the Nutting Squad, which was the department in charge of internal security. So they were sniffing out informers, uh, interrogating them, sometimes torturing them, often killing them. So he was uh, a, a, an extremely uh, uh, hard-nosed individual. And uh, this photo is of the street corner where in 1999, some of his ex-colleagues caught up with him and killed him with hammers. So uh, let me show you a piece of video that I have from, uh, this, from the first presentation of this work in Venice. I'd like to be Eamon. Hello, Eamon. I'll stay on the line while you walk. Keep your eyes open. Act natural. 
There's always a first time for this kind of thing, and practice makes it easier. I'm going to count to ten. If you're still on the line when I get to ten, then I'll know where you stand. One, the two killers ride into Warren Point on a motorbike. Two, they switch the engine off, allowing the bike to glide the last 20 meters so as not to raise the alarm. Three, once inside, Iceman goes down the corridor into Toombs' office. Four, he takes up a firing position with arms outstretched. Five, his gun jams, giving Toombs enough time to reach for his own weapon. Six, Iceman leaps onto him and the two men struggle. Seven, a second gunman comes running down the hall and shouts, stand back. Eight, Iceman lets go and the second man fires several shots into Toombs. Nine, Iceman clears his weapon. 10. He pumps several more rounds into tombs as he lies dying. Don't be shy. It's a question we all have to answer from time to time. And today, it's your turn. What can you do for the people around you? Now, get moving. Stand up and walk away from the bench. Do not look back. You're in the cell at Goff Barracks and they've got you for seven days. The first two interrogators are efficient and by the book. Give us an alibi and it'll all go away. The next two wear smart suits and are very calm. Will you not just answer a few simple questions? My name is Ulrika, and I'm a decisive person. As you stand at the water's edge, you need to make a very important choice. If you want to quit, hang up right now. Eamon, you've made your choice. The next man says, Not enjoying the verbal abuse, Eamon? What'd you give me if it were you interrogating me in some barn in South Armagh, eh? Wouldn't be verbal abuse, you murdering cunt. No, you'd be taking lumps out of me with an iron bar before you put a hole in my fucking head. That's what you'd do, Eamon. You know it, and I know it. It's right. And all of a sudden, a peculiar feeling rises up within you. You stand up and, smiling at the two men, you say, I want to speak to someone in authority. What would you fight for? Okay, can I, so I'm going to leave it there. So that's a compression of about 40 minutes of, of activity into that tiny little edit there. So, you know, you're just getting a flavour of her walk through the city, this key moment where you're given this choice about whether you go to this interrogation room or not, and sitting down, meeting this, this person and being asked, what would you fight for? So this is a work really about, uh, <clears throat> about political commitment and um, the, the conversation that unfolds in that room for the next five or 10 minutes for each person who participates is a, a detailed discussion about your own position, about whether you would or would not under any circumstance take violent action and to, 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 to kind of get in among the, 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 the challenges of, of, of either position, of either a completely pacifist position or a position where you accept that under certain circumstances you would pick up arms. And um, this, this work was um, heavily influenced by uh, a British philosopher. Um, to, I'm going to jump straight over that. This woman here, Philippa Foote. Um, who, who coined a, uh, a, a branch of philosophy in the 1960s called Trolley Dilemmas. I don't know, does anyone come across the Trolley Dilemma? Does that mean anything? So it's, it's this simple formulation, which is a trolley or a, you know, a carriage is running out of control down a train track. In its path are five people who are going to get killed. You can flip a switch, which will lead that trolley down a different track to safety. Unfortunately, there is a single person tied to that track should you flip the switch. So it's a, a key question of 
would you, under certain circumstances, kill someone in order to save the lives of five other people? And um, Philippa Foote wrote this in the context of discussion about abortion and the, the moral and ethical dilemmas about abortion. But what became, what, the reason it's become very significant and has really um, opened up an entire branch of, of philosophical inquiry that's um, uh, um, grown since, since that um, initial formulation is it's a way of inviting any one of us in this room to think about a moral or an ethical problem and to try and work out how we would position ourselves to it. So it, 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 although it's a kind of binary question, to answer it, 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 it uh, triggers and enacts a whole bunch of questions, a whole bunch of, uh, of, of thoughts and discussions about how you would position yourself in that debate. And then you can subtly change the terms of that trolley dilemma. So uh, there's a version, for example, where you're stood on a bridge over, and over the track and rather than just flipping a switch to, 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 to move the, tra the, the trolley away, you would have to push someone over the bridge onto the track. And that, as it hits them and kills them, it will be, it will be derailed and you'll save five. And I think you, know, we, you can all know that that feels completely different, even though at a utilitarian level, you're still killing one person to save five. There's something about pushing someone off a bridge that is a, a totally different proposition. And so, that, that insight really informs that work and a lot of the thinking we have about interactive work, which is how far you can um, uh, uh, try and create complex questions in simple interactive structures. And then to finish, um, I'm, I'm going to just talk about uh, um, uh, an older project and how it's leading into the project that we're, that we're doing now, which, is, uh, uh, um, uh, which I've been here in, in, in New York to talk about this week. So first of all, uh, I'm going to want to talk to you about this project, Ivy Forever, and uh, I, I haven't got video of this. This is a, um, a work commissioned by Channel 4 in the UK, the, uh, a, a public sector broadcaster. It's their education department, and they came to us and said, no one watches, no teenagers watch TV anymore, especially not educational TV. We've been doing loads of work online and on the web, and it's working really well for us. But we're aware that over 30% of the UK population of teenagers don't have easy access to the web. Can you do something that will engage that age group around issues of sex and drugs on a platform that is native to them? So we did a whole bunch of research, and we came up with the, the fact that SMS, text messaging, that is the, the native language for that group, and that is as near ubiquitous as you get. It's over 99% of that age group in the UK have access to text messaging. Uh, whereas, as I, say, as I say, internet is about 70% in terms of easy and regular access. And um, so what we made is, a, is an interactive drama where Ivy uh, texts you as if you are a friend of hers. So uh, on a given day, you get a text message from her saying, hi, it's me. Uh, you know, I'm so annoyed with my mom. I'm going to leave home for a few days. I'm going to go and stay with my friend Ads. And she starts to, to text you in that way. And any one of those messages, you can text back to her, and she will hold a conversation with you. And for the next week, you basically follow her through one of those moments in life that you can sometimes have when you're 17 years old, where a whole bunch of new things pop up. She goes to stay with her friend Ads. They, they're about to do a gig, but they don't have a singer. They ask her if she'll sing on a couple of songs. So she performs. Uh, after the gig, she gets uh, uh, she slightly overdoes it and uh, gets gets a bit wasted. She gets into an entanglement with someone that goes a bit wrong. Uh, she's she's, uh, she's already suffering a pregnancy scare, which is why she's left home in the first place. So you see her in a in a in a classically teenage moment that is both exciting and mixed up and complex. This is not a work to educate teenagers about sex and drugs. This is a, a work where 13 to 16 year olds can have a conversation with someone who is older about those things and to see it through her eyes. Um, we felt that that was a, a you know, that there was a there's, a, there's an endless supply of websites that tell you what, you know, uh, cocaine is or what MDMA is and how dangerous it is. But there's very little about how you actually navigate that. You know, it's like, it, if you assume that as a teenager you'll never do it, well, it's very simple. But if you assume that as a teenager you might be curious or under certain circumstances you might take risks in terms of sex and drugs, then who do you talk to about that? And we wanted Ivy to be a kind of confidant um, for that. And <clears throat> as, a, as a way of sort of illustrating uh, what, this, what this means, what this looks like, I, I just pulled out a little dialogue to show you, which is Ivy on the left talking to one of the participants on the right. And I'll just step through this for you. So Ivy sends a message. Hey, C, personal question. Know someone who missed their period. 
And this um, participant replies, um, no, I don't think I have, but I've seen stuff on the television about it. Not the same, I know. See, kiss. Sorry to be nosy, you're lucky. I can't talk to my parents about stuff like this, though. Can you? It's okay. Well, I could, but I don't think I could. See, kiss. Really, you're lucky then. Always thought I would have told little sis about something like this, who is Ivy's younger sister. Yeah, but I'd be scared to how they would react. Sometimes you have to make hard decisions in life, bad or good. See, kiss. Don't really trust her now. Ad said, if I am, do I know who the father would be? Q, what's he take me for? Maybe he's worried for you. Maybe he's just worried for you. People say things that they think sounds good or supportive, but the intent comes out wrong when they're worried. See, kiss. He's looking out for me, I know. Sorry if I'm being boring. For some reason, I feel like I can talk to you about it. Do you mind? No, not at all. I'm happy to help. See, kiss. So, on the left, was a, that's a script written by Tony White, an author who collaborated with us, all authored in advance. Every single response that you saw is automated. And on the right is Caitlin513, who is sending those messages in real time, who we know to be 13 years old from the research that we did. And I want to just sort of jump back uh, to, to, sort of rate, to, to sort of highlight a couple of things there. One is, it's quite clear from Caitlin's messages that she does not think she's talking to a computer, right? There's no way that you would author messages of that sensitivity. And that there's this incredible emotional maturity in the messages that this 13-year-old is sending. You know, if you look down at that sort of lower level there, Ad said, if I am, do I know who the father would be? What's he take me for? With three question marks, it's clear that Ivy's upset and annoyed at Ad's for that. And Caitlin comes back with a response, which is a really subtle and sophisticated defense of ads about why he might have thought that. And she's used almost every single character count available in a text message to do that. It's also interesting to see how the language really mirrors. So, so along with Tony, we did loads of research into the actual grammar of text messaging. And at this time in the UK, there were still lots of people who assumed that it was all lol this and, you know, uh, 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 you know, endless amounts of sort of uh, text teen speak. And in fact, you know, our research showed that that's not really true. What you get is some slightly slippery grammar, but actually you get people writing in, in, in full formal English in, in lots of ways. And that's exactly what you see here. You know, there's, there's interesting little bits here where um, Ivy says, you're lucky then, which is clearly the wrong spelling of your. And uh, Caitlin replies with maybe he's just worried for you with a full stop and then a question mark. So you've got these like subtle, um, uh, 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 variations on, on correct English, but that, 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 that they feel really symmetrical. And one of the things that we kind of stumbled on in this project is that text messaging is so brilliant for so many things in terms of artistic potential. When we first started, we were like, wow, this is going to be so limiting. It's, we've got no colors, no sound, no pictures. We can't even control the font. We can't control any aspect of, this, of the aesthetics of this experience. All we've got is a character count. That's it. And 160 characters is incredibly compressed. And every single message has to end in a question to invite the participant to reply. So if you look there, every single one of those, it's quite clear that she's inviting you to reply. But one of the golden things that we found was that actually the very limitations of, those, of that format on our side were, meant that the, the, the conversation from Ivy and the conversation from Caitlin match each other absolutely perfectly. Caitlin also speaks with 160 characters, and that's all she has. And so there's a really beautiful mirror and equivalence between the utterances of our fictional character and the utterances of the people who are participating in the work. And that led to an incredibly high level of engagement. So on average, messages received about a 90% response rate. That was, um, if I just jump back for a second, you can't really see it very well here, but this, that's, that's what this graph is here, which is the percentage of people who reply to any given message. And the lowest it goes down to is about 65% on that one message, the third one and the rest are up in the 80s and 90s, mostly over 90%. So we saw this really, really high level of engagement from, from teenagers around that. And we, what we wanted to try and do is use the real properties that SMS has about uh, of being intimate and, 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 and quasi-anonymous. You know, you tend to know who sends you a text message, but you don't always. And sometimes you'll get a message from someone who you don't know who it is, but 
you don't know who the message is from, but in fact, it's someone you know. And sometimes you get a message where you don't know who it's from, and in fact, it's from a complete stranger. And so we knew there was a kind of, um, there's a world there where you could, um, you, you could create a certain kind of tone of engagement. So ever since we did that project, we were like, wow, we have to come back to that idea of talking to a character. It's so exciting. It's so rich. There's something that we have to do there. But we couldn't find uh, exactly the right format to do that until we came up with this idea, which is the project that we're about to launch and we're about to do a Kickstarter on. Shocking. Uh, so uh, it, 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 the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Kickstarter starts next week. And uh, so, so what, we, what we're working on is a smartphone app called Karen, where Karen is a, a life coach. And when you, when you launch the app for the first time, you meet her and she starts to talk to you uh, as, as a life coach and go, great, it's great you've come to see me. Let's run through a few things. Uh, let me find out a little bit about you. And um, she's fairly professional in that first um, conversation. But over the next couple of days, the boundaries between her professional life and her personal life start to break down a little bit. And she starts to contact you from home. And she starts to talk to you about things where you're thinking, is that strictly necessary in terms of life coaching? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. And, and it becomes clear that you know, Karen, like some life coaches, is better at thinking about how she can fix other people's lives than fixing her own. And um, she's, she's, she, uh, she, she strays a little bit out of, out of control. So this is a piece we haven't um, made yet, but I do have uh, a bit of video which is just of, uh, of, of, a, of an early prototype. So what you're seeing here is something that was uh, shot in an afternoon with Sarah, who's our assistant, saying, OK, well, I'll step in. I'll play Karen. So this is like the, you know, the earliest prototype of how might this work. And in this sequence, she's showing you around her apartment. Last toy collection. So these guys here. It's got a little bear and a monkey. And then we've got some of the, the best of the bunch here. Here we are, we've got killer whale, a little pig, and a rhino. And I wondered which one is your favourite animal? Okay, so I'm just going to stop it there, just uh, just to give you a little kind of flavour of, of of how it works. Um, but in fact, uh, you know, the motivation behind this is around how um, data is being manipulated in the background, uh, how your uh, profiling and personalization. Uh, systems are being used on you in almost every single um, digital domain. And so um, what, lit what sits behind this work and what we've been researching for the last two years is using psychological and behavioral profiling techniques in the background. So uh, every question that Karen asks you is in fact referring back to a psychological profiling approach. I've got two here that I just pulled out at random, the sexual inhibition and sexual excitation scales and this one in front, the Cognitive Failures Questionnaire. And so you can see that these are kind of just standard kind of personality profiling type questionnaires. Some of you may have done them at one time or another, you know, which is like uh, number six there on the Cognitive Failure. Do you find you forget whether you've turned off a light or a fire or locked the door? Very often, quite often, occasionally, very rarely or never. So it's just, it's about those little moments in life where you kind of slightly miss something or skip over something. This is a questionnaire. This was devised in 1982. It's been used tens of thousands of times worldwide. So there's an incredibly strong corpus of data underneath it. And um, uh, uh, researchers know with tremendous accuracy um, the efficacy of these kinds of tests. So what we wanted to do is create an app where um, it's, it's very personal personalized to you. So we, we, we're making uh, um, deductions about your personality type using these kinds of questionnaires. And how Karen talks to you and what she talks to you about is then adaptive according to uh, 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 the deductions we make. So if we think you're more introvert, she might talk to you in one way. If we think you're more extrovert, she might talk to you in another way. 
And what we wanted to do is make a piece of work that is a, a critique uh, of the ways in which large companies are using big data. So at the end of this work, if you complete it, you have the option to get hold of your, your full data report on this work where we'll give you a report that shows everything that you did in the app, what we did with that information and how we made use of it, and which of these psychological profiling questionnaires it was used from. So you'll get these three layers, and it'll give you a chance to kind of show all the assumptions, all the variables that were sitting behind that. So you'll get to kind of understand a little bit about what, what's going on in the background. And if we, a group of three artists, can do that to you, what Facebook, Google, the NSA can do is, um, is, is kind of shocking to think because there is no way on earth that we are the only people who have thought about these kinds of approaches. They are clearly going to be something that is being used in a very widespread way. So, you know, we, have a, we, we, we hope that we're going to make an app that is exciting and compelling to use that's going to feel fresh and different. I think there's still real opportunity in terms of doing great apps. I really feel there's a, there's a gap in terms of really good, rich apps. You know, they're, they're, they are out there, but they're, they're fewer and far further between than I would I ideally like. I really think uh, it's, it's, it's been a while anyway for me since I've seen an app that I was like, wow, that is amazing. So we really hope that we can do something in terms of how artists can use apps that, that breaks new ground. And we think we can do something that really helps contribute to the debate around how data is, is, is being used. Um, and I'm going to finish there. So thanks very much for your time. So I think we have some time for questions. Um, so this one, uh, it sounds really interesting, the tree of questions that you asked. But was, I was curious if the IB Forever one was a straight script, or did that one also vary on the answers? Okay. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination. Oh, that, that graph really has been lost completely. So. Um, the way that Ivy worked is that uh, there, are 100, there are 44 story messages over seven days. Every single person gets those, one of those 44 messages. So the, the plot of the, of the thing unfolds in a certain way regardless. So she always goes away to stay with her friend Ads. She always sings at the gig, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then what we built was what we call ladders, which is that uh, certain messages would open up for a, 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 a conversation. So, for example, she might say, I've missed my period. And then if you responded to that, she would then engage you with a conversation around pregnancy and pregnancy scares. And that's the sample that we saw there. That was uh, a, a ladder around pregnancy. So there's, there's, in fact, probably 15 questions in that ladder. We just saw a, a sample of them. And then there's some about music, and there's some about family, and some about friends. And so we built all of these different kinds of conversations. Um, but it's, it's a very simple piece of software. It's just, a, it's just a text listener. And in fact, you know, the more suit among you might have spotted that there's a kind of slight mistake in, 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 uh, in that dialogue that I showed you. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't always work. Yeah. How, um, how did you get permission to contact teenagers? Um, <laughs> yeah, you skipped a slide that said ethics. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just see. What does, that, what does the ethics slide say? <laughs> Ethical challenges. No, I mean, uh, you know, this is, this is, yeah, this is around the ethics of that, that particular conversation, which I, I didn't sort of really have time to go into today. Uh, I, uh, I'll come to your question by a sort of circuitous route, which is that we did some research after this, which said how many of the messages you received were from a computer a mixture of a computer and a human, and were written entirely by a human. And it was over 30% of people thought the messages were written entirely by a human. So that's one of the big ethical dilemmas is, does Caitlin 513 actually believe that she's talking to a human being? And if she does, what are the ethics of that, where she's opening up about something intensely personal and you know, in, 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 in a fictional setting? In terms of um, the, the, the specifics of your question, Channel 4 is a public service broadcaster. They have enormous legal constraints around what they do. Uh, in the nine months before this project launched, all the major TV stations in the UK were caught out where they had been running competitions that were nothing of the kind, and they had been playing fast and loose with how people did that. So for example, you pay £1.50 for a text message to enter. They did a thing where they didn't really bother to clearly cut the line 
between when the, the, the competition was closed and when you kept sending your text. So they charged tens of thousands of people for a £1.50 text for a competition that had already closed. And so there was all this kind of abuse of mobile phones. So broadcasters were freaking out about the use of mobile phones. And then we turn up and say, we want to talk to 13-year-olds about sex and drugs on their mobile phones. And it's, it is a credit, I think, ultimately to Channel 4 that this project ever saw the light of day. They kept it very tightly compartmentalized, but it had to go to the board level within that broadcaster, and it was nine months of compliance. There were tremendously onerous requirements in terms of what the acceptances were. Uh, you were uh, supposed to get parental approval, but everyone knows that teens don't do that. So it says, if you're under 16, you must have this approved by a parent. There's a box there, but no one's fooled for a second. But what, what was, um, more onerous is that you had to sign up via text message, get a text message back, and that text message then had an email link. You then had to go online and send an email and get an, a, a, a link back from that. You had to do, we had to do a double certification for every single person to get them in, and that was, you know, had a massive impact on on uptake. Uh, I'm curious, like, with because I noticed that all these. Um things you're running are like the they're speaking with like a woman I'm wondering if you've ever thought about playing with different like genders and like how the reaction probably differ. It's so um, interesting that, that you raise that because this week we've been editing our Kickstarter video and we thought we had it in a place that was really good and then we showed it to a number of people and two or three of them just said oh it just feels really icky and wrong as a woman I would not do this this just feels you know like the tone of this is off uh, we had a shot of her getting out of the shower, and people were like, "Oh no, that just feels wrong." So we've just been back to do uh, to, to, to kind of to kind of reshape that. We have done a number of projects that are about conversations with men. We've done a piece of work called Uncle Roy All Around You, and another one called I Like Frank. So it's it's um, uh, and obviously Ulrika and Amy compliant is a man and a woman. So. Um, it's not that we're entirely um, uh, kind of skewed one way on that. I think it's just about um, the ways in which you might come into a conversation and what, uh, 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 how, you, how, how you can find an emotional tone that is appropriate both for men and women. In this case, with Karen, it just feels like uh, it's, it, it's important that she's a female character. Um, and, uh, you know, but I'd be lying if I said that that's not something that we're discussing all the time about what are the limits, you know, intimacy in terms of her being a woman and the potentials of what that means if you're a woman engaging with her and what that means if you're a man engaging with her and different age groups and all of that sort of stuff. It's a really difficult line to walk. I've kind of noticed just the different projects there's, um, it seems like varying levels of participation. So like the first, uh, I hide you. There were like three, like actual street players. Even though a lot of people can play from their computers, yeah. um, I'm just putting myself in your shoes. If you're like doing a bunch of awesome projects, um, I imagine it's hard to like have enough steam to continue all of them. Um, so, I guess this is kind of a broad question about like how important is like openness or accessibility, and then how how many of these projects will you guys continue to see to like, carry out? So, um, so openness is obviously really important, you know, and I gave you that example of sort of the audience member who we're, who we're thinking about. But clearly, some of them have a much higher threshold to cross when you're making a piece of work in the opening week of the Venice Biennale. I'm not kidding myself that we're reaching some sort of diverse audience, right? It's the art world at peak uh, output. Um, so that's why something like Ivy Forever and I'd Hide You is, is really important for us so that we're looking for different, different strategies and different levels of, of engagement and participation. In terms of keeping things going, I mean, we're a team of seven and we're able to, one of the reasons um, to have us at that level of seven full-time employees is to be able to deliver these projects around the world over and over and over again. So um, that, that um, work I showed earlier on with the photo of, of Dicky um, running through the streets of Cologne, this project here, that's called Can You See Me Now? That work was first shown in 2001, and the last performance of that was at Tate Britain in 2011, 
We showed that for 10 years straight in 20 cities around the world. And we have a piece of work at the moment called Rider Spoke, which is a work for cyclists with a, with a tablet mounted on your handlebars. And that was first done in 2007. In 2007, we just did it this summer in the Tour de France when it was here, in, when it was over in England. So we keep those works in the repertoire as long as people will pay us to show them to be perfectly frank, it's not out, you know, we're, we're, we're dependent on people inviting us to, to do that. But um, that, that, um, that balance between trying to make challenging projects that you might do once and then projects that we can really tour, even Ulrika and Aim and Compliant, when we first did that in Venice, there were a crew of 20 of us to deliver that project. Uh, the last time, the most recent time we did that, we did that with three of us because over, a number of international invitations were able to just to streamline a streamline and do a bit more software development to cut two people out there and you know all of that you know to 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 to, to tighten it back and back and back so that we can reduce the cost and we can keep distributing it any other questions yeah stephanie had said that you're uh, you're at the future of storytelling yes, so exactly. yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that mm. only heard a little about it sometimes. yeah i mean it's um it's a two-day conference um, that happened Wednesday and Thursday this week. It's annual. It's run by a guy called Charlie Melcher. It's, um, the, the, the main day takes place out at Snug Harbor, so you meet at, in Manhattan, and then you get on the ferry, and you go out to Snug Harbor there on the ferry, and then there's uh, events there all day. And then the second day is a, 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 a walk. Half of the delegates go to Brooklyn, half go to Manhattan, and jump from company to company to company. So yesterday I went to Radical Media, Sub Rosa, and then a whole bunch of people went to Google Creative Lab. The idea is to make something that's sort of immersive and different in format. And one of the things they do that's really nice is that if you're invited to speak, uh, 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 they make a video with you. So we, I, I shot a video in June or July, a five minute video about big data and this Karen project. And then they distribute that to all the delegates so people watch the video before they come. And then the sessions are actually an hour long conversations about that video. So there is not, a, you know, this kind of format does not exist at all at, at Future of Storytelling. It's all about, um, conversations and it's uh, you know it's a mix of mix of, of artists and independent creatives, but it heavily skews to large um, corporate people. You know Nickelodeon are there in massive numbers, Autodesk, Microsoft. You know those those are the sort of people who are really really attending. It's pretty expensive to attend, but it, you know I, I thought it was I thought it was you know some of it w that works well worked really well. Will we be able to see that video you made for the? Camera? Yeah, it's online. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they put them all online. I, th I think. I think that's I right. They're on YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. And also what they do, they then do a series of Google Hangouts during the year where they, they will pick one of the keynote speakers and then organize a Google Hangout with three or four others to discuss that issue again. So I presume I'll probably do one of those in the next sort of four or six months because I did a couple last year, so. Cool. So you are sticking around for lunch, right? I oh, am. Yeah. So never turn, <laughs> never walk past a free lunch, <laughs> Stephanie. So lunch is served, yeah. and we'll continue the conversation over lunch. Right. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much.